please, Marco, uh, great to have you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you for kind introduction. So, yeah, so in, in this talk, so I would try like to mix a uh, present results for like four different papers. Well, I'll focus more on this one here that discuss like unitary inversion, like helping about unitaries. But then we'll discuss a bit other results. And most of the work was made with my previous group in Japan, Miyomura. And some part of this work is also my collaborator, Daniel Ebla, that is in Hong Kong. So great. So I think, so one of the most important thing is to understand like, what is the question? Like, so, and we're going to start with an example. I like, try to understand what Michal mentioned is higher order. So let's focus on this example. Imagine that you have a unitary operation and you want to transform it to the inverse. And then we may ask, okay, but what do you mean by that? So, well, one example, like if your unitary operation is a qubit sigma z, it's already self-inverse, so you don't need to do anything. So you can ask like, what do we want? And instead of like describing formally what we want now, I will just show an example that I think will enlighten the situation. So ideally, I would like something like this. Actually, this example here, well, let's try to understand it better. So this U2 here, so this is a qubit unitary, any qubit unitary. So you can imagine like as a black box that implements a qubit unitary, someone comes to you, but to your lab and say, hey, this is yours, you can use it. And then or as a standard in quantum circuit, like time will flow from left to right. So imagine that before this unitary, you plug like a box that implements sigma y, the Pauli operation. And after you do a sigma y, then, you can understand this whole chunk of circuit here. You can do like a simple math and realize that this is exactly equal. It's the same thing as the complex conjugation of U2, where here the complex conjugate assumes the computational basis, man. Right? So if you fix the computational basis, this is complex conjugation of the matrix. And I don't know, like for me, the first time I saw that, it was actually this guy here, this Miyazaki, when I arrived in Japan, and I got very surprised. I funny thing is that now this guy is a Buddhist monk, and he's still doing research. <laughs> so, and I don't know. For me, this was very surprising. I think this is very interesting because, well, you don't need to do much, right? You just perform a sigma y before and after, and you transform a unitary operation. So it's very simple, and it works for any qubit unitary. And even if you go with more details, like I don't know, like complex conjugation, it's not even linear. Okay, it's anti-linear, like, so there are some things that I didn't understand. But the fact that this holds true, and the reason why this is true is because of this identity here. That for any unitary that has a determinant one, this SU2, this equality holds. And since unitary operations, they are equivalent up to a global phase, we can also always assume that they have determinant one. Okay, I would like something like this. I would like to get any qubit unitary or even dimensional, do one operation before, one operation after. And here, instead of having the complex conjugation, I would like to have like the inverse. So that's what we want. Okay. And also the main question, so here like I'm doing this inverse as an example, but I'd like to understand better transformation between operations, not only unitary, not only inverse. So let's keep inverse in mind as an example and see what we can understand. So now try to be a bit more formal, like what we want, we want it to be universal. So a circuit or a method to transform that works for any unitary operations. So it works for any, this unknown dimensional unitary. So if someone comes to your lab and say, hey, this is a d-dimensional unitary. Apart from the dimension, you don't know anything more. And well, let's start ambitious and ask that I would like this to be exact. So transformation like to work perfectly. So and then you can ask a question like, is such a thing possible? And it turns out that this question was studied before this previous paper. Like we didn't came up with we didn't come up with this question. And they actually proved that the optimal average fidelity for this task is two over d square. Or if we plug qubits, right? We have one half. So it means that even for qubits, this is not possible. So our task is 
So, so, so uh, Marco, can, uh, yeah. just for people that know uh, don't know this this technical term, so can you explain this what this average fidelity means in this context? Yes. So actually, in a later slide I will present, but for now, so maybe you have seen like fidelity of like few quantum states. So if you have like the fidelity of two quantum states, basically it's the overlap of these states, like the inner product. Sometimes people put squared as more variations, but the important, uh, I'll say it's just a way to quantify the protocol. So, and if the fidelity is one, it means it works exactly. And then you can check like on average, how the fidelity goes. I don't think, well, at least for now, it's not important to know how they evaluate this number or the precise definition of fidelity, but I can say it's the fidelity between channels. So it's, it's a way to quantify somehow how, similar two channels are and well for now it's uh, the, the, mm -hmm. uh, thanks yeah that's... i think for now the point is just that this cannot be done exactly then we we go back with fidelity mm -hmm. so uh, uh sorry marco just a quick yes. question like so but for qubit it's uh, one half uh, then this maximal fidelity here yes 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 um, yes uh, so uh, okay, uh, so maybe I just missed. Uh, like, can you? Uh, what is the goal once again? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the goal is to do something, to perform some operation, and then here we plug any. Let's start with qubit, any qubit unitary, and here another operation, and I would like this to be the inverse. Sure. Okay. Awesome. Great. Great. Yes. So, yes. That's yes, uh, yes. that's fine. Mm -hmm. yes. So even for qubit, it's uh, even for qubit. Yes, because for the complex conjugation, there was this result somehow surprising that if you plug sigma y, it works. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and actually, I, I already re review like this the result here like that they have actually they even consider some auxiliary space. So. Where here, for example, here you plug your qubit unitary, here, even with auxiliary so this subspace, this you have this extra line here. But so then these guys here, like, they have shown that the task we are looking for is not possible. So and now we are going to change a bit the question, but we are going to accept accept protocols that are probabilistic. This probabilistic heralded. So what we mean here is that we're going to try, and if it works, we know that it works. And if it fails, we know that it fails. But when it works, it's exact. It's perfect. So we have the inverse exactly. And when it fails, we don't care. So, and it turns out that for qubits, it's possible. So if we accept this probabilistic thing, like it's possible. And I'd say the more than possible, it's actually fairly, simple so that's how you do it so let's try to make sense out of it so here it's where we're going to plug this state this you choose any qubit unitary or why oh, sorry for changing notation i realize but why here is just sigma y this guy here it's a maximally entangled state a qubit maximally entangled state zero zero And this measurement here, so this is going to be a quantum measurement. This is going to be a measurement in the Bell basis. And then like for, for now, what, what I'm telling you is if you prepare a maximally entangled state, half of it you send through this upper line here, the circuit, and then you perform a measurement. For any state, any input state that you plug here, basically well, what I'm saying that this whole chunk, it's equal to the inverse of you with some probability. So let's show a bit more of detail. So this measurement here, let's say, so it's this Bell measurement. Maybe you have seen it before. So here I, I wrote like a formal definition, but it's basically, it can, it's a measurement that you can have as an outcome, any of the four Bell states, two qubit maximal entangled states. And one way to formalize this measurement is to say that you associate one outcome to each of these Bell states. So in particular, you can write it like this, 
where i and j are bits like zero one. So then you associate, for example, this to zero zero, this to zero one, one zero one one. And now, well, maybe for the moment you can try to you can trust me, but we can try to do this calculation. What I, my claim is for any input state that you plug in, anything that you plug, what comes out of this circuit, it's this. That's the output state, and this holds true for for any input state Oops. and for any qubit unitary. So now if you want to understand why we have this, maybe you can check that this is very similar to quantum teleportation. So the first observation, we know already that this chunk here means complex conjugation. And also maybe you have seen that the the maximum entangled state has this interesting property here that you can change size by basically paying the price of a transposition. So maybe that now helps a little bit. So this is the complex conjugation. Now, if we change this line here to the bottom, because this is identity, we have the inverse. And now because of this calculation of teleportation, well, we, it depends on the outcome I and J that we have. Well, it's not, I think, so important to follow exactly, just to give you an idea that it's not so complicated, but with probability one over four, well, this we have this I equals J equals zero, and this thing here becomes identity, meaning that this whole circuit with probability one over four implements the unitary inverse. And it's heralded in the sense that we know when we get it right, if we check that our outcome is i equal j equals zero, then you invert it like a, any qubit unitary. Okay. And an interesting observation is then, uh, I'll show this picture here. Here, it, it works for any state. I, I put this in here just to emphasize, but well, we just imagine like a line without this part here. You can understand this whole chunk here as a circuit. But interesting. We don't need the input state in the beginning. Basically, we can get this line and plug it to here. So it, this is interesting because this protocol is what we like to call this a delayed input state. Meaning that in order to perform the circuit, you can do as following. Imagine that I want you to implement the inverse. And then I can maybe come to your lab today. I have a qubit unitary operation and I give it to you. Say, hey, you can use it. Then you make your use, you use this unitary. And then I say, now I need you to give me back. I get it back. And one week later, you implement the inverse. This is possible because the first part of the circuit, this part here, well, you just prepare a maximum entangled state in your lab, and you stock this quantum state here. And one week later, you perform the joint measurement. So you can delay the use of the input state. I think this is interesting. Just to remark, this is different than the complex conjugation case that was like this. Because for the complex conjugation case, like we need to perform the sigma y before and the sigma y after. So you cannot delay the use. The so, okay. Now, a few questions. Like first, is it, is it optimal line? I said the probability of success is one over four. Is it optimal line? Another question like, how do we go for qubits? Like, can, does that generalize? Or it's a particular feature of qubits. And how can we increase the success probability? Like, which kind of price are we willing to pay to increase the success probability? And before addressing these questions, I'll mention or talk a little bit about these higher order operations and these super maps, super chains. So, this one way to. Uh, see sorry, Mar uh, Marco. Uh, yes. Can I ask, uh, can you do something? without uh, having auxiliary systems? Is it possible to have maybe with smaller success? Pro okay, this is maybe a bit uh, like, yeah. So for, for the like inverse? For, for the inverse, yeah. No, no, you can do exact, no. You can do like a deterministic approximation. This you can. Actually, the question is way, way harder. 
So, uh, but using only a single uh, single copy of a unitary, right? Yes, but it, uh, it, it's okay. hard. Actually, to be honest, maybe this one is with a single use. Maybe it's not so hard to calculate. Uh, it's not published anywhere. And this previous work by Julio and Daniel, they consider the case where you have this potentially you use this auxiliary space and they do use. And it's actually funny because this is the kind of situation where not having an auxiliary space makes the problem harder, right? Because checking positivity is harder. Okay. So thank you. So well, now I'll present a bit about this like super map, super genus higher order, because this is a, I don't know, the formalism, the mathematical tools that we can use to tackle the question I presented. So well, actually this idea of like super genus, it appeared like several times in the literature. I think this two references here for me are the, one of the important ones, but they are not the only ones. There are other papers doing essentially the same thing. And let's try to make sense out of this drawing here. So here, this lambda in, imagine this to be like any physical operation, like any channel. Well, that you just have like a fixed dimension, like here on two and three, but it can be any channel. And this E and D, they stand for encoder and decoder. So I'd like you to imagine basically this as like a fixed thing that you can have like in your lab. So like this T form that you, when you plug in between this input operation, the whole chunk becomes an output operation now from one to four. So this is a kind of like generalization of the, the question that I was mentioning before. Right? So for any input operation, like transforming states from space two and three, so you can plug this encoder and decoder, and then you have a final, like an output operation. And, and there are nice like results like regarding to this. One, you can ask like, so this is like a constructive approach. Right? So basically I'm telling you how, if you want to transform quantum operations, you can imagine a quantum circuit where you have an encoder and decoder. Well, it's very, I'm telling you like how to implement, but you can try to go a bit more abstract and ask yourself like, what is the most general way to transform quantum operations? And basically you can prove that the most general thing is actually doing a circuit. Of course, that in order to prove that you need some hypothesis that they are like very plausible. Well, we can discuss a bit later, but the only hypothesis they need is that you transform basically valid channels to channel. So this is interesting. Like it, it kind of showed that the formalism is strong. But so, so well, just can I have a quick question? Is, yes, yes. In this, in this business, is there an analog of complete positivity? Something like uh, yes, yes, yes. So basically, this theorem is a generalization of Stein spring dilation. Mm -hmm. but, uh, this is something something nice to, to mention. Like we have something very similar for quantum states, right? So some people, they like to imagine like quantum transformations on quantum states. So if you want to transform like input states to output states, in quantum mechanics. So if you impose linearity and if you impose completely positive that you have good arguments for that. And if you impose that you want states to states, well, so then it's also trace preserving. Actually, positivity is also like for free, I'd say. Completely positive, you need to think a little bit. And linearity, well, because you want to preserve like probabilities, convex combinations, you can try to argue. From this, you can prove that you have a quantum chain. And also you can understand like a, a quantum transformation always as like having an auxiliary state performing a global unitary, and then you discard state. So if this is like input out, right? This is the Stein, Stein spring dilation. And any quantum channel can be understood as an unitary operation on a larger space and vice versa. Any unitary operation larger space is a quantum channel. This is something very similar to what we have here. Like the mathematically, it's basically a generalization of this Stein spring dilation. Okay, after this short, digression or related one. 
So we can go back to a question like now with this formalism with this strong mathematical background and we can answer a few questions. So one question, is it optimal? Actually, we can show that yes, for qubits, the optimal probability success must respect this. Well, this is not so hard to prove, but I think it's not the point to show it here now. And nice, so the protocol I present is actually optimal. And what about general qubits? And actually we can show that for general qubits, the probability of success is zero. So it was indeed a particularity of qubit. Thing. And how can we increase the success probabilities? Of course, here there are many solutions. Like we can, for example, say that, okay, requiring exact is too much. So I drop, I accept some error. Then the way we decide to tackle first is to consider like more calls or like more copies. So like this, for example, in this guy here is what we call like a parallel protocol or a parallel circuit where you have, you can have an encoder may use some auxiliary space here. And then, oh, sorry. And then we have like K uses of a unitary operation in parallel. And we can also consider like a, a sequential circuit with many different encoders. And this guy here, like many people refer to as like quantum, quantum combs. Also quantum strategies, quantum blah, blah, blah. There are many names for this. So now I'll do like a big jump. And instead of showing more, well, ideas, I'll just show like some results and then we can go back. So, so using this mathematical formalism, we could show that in parallel, the optimal protocol for unitary inversion actually provides you this probability here. So this is for qubits, D equals two, right? And K stands for a number of users. And also like this part. Yes. So, sorry, it's a bit surprising that it doesn't depend on, ah, sorry, maybe, no. I, sorry, it's, it's for qubits. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay, for okay, sorry. Like, yeah, so for qubits, actually this is the only case that where we could have like a simple closed formula. And and actually maybe of, if you are, the people are familiar, actually this is the same thing for the sport-based teleportation that is kind of behind the, the proof. We can discuss a bit later. I have a slide on part-based teleportation. That's a technique we use. The part-based teleportation provides a solution and then you just need to show that it's optimal. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing that uh, in parallel, we could show that if the number of uses is, is smaller than D minus one, so now not only for qubits, like if you consider, for example, qubits, like dimension three, and if you have a single use, so here K stands for the number of uses, then the probability of success is zero. So, but if D, uh, if the number of uses is greater than or equal, then it becomes possible. So, well, actually there's this formula here, to be honest, I don't think you need to worry because if we have this upper and lower bounds, I think like for, for this talk, the only important thing is then for large number of users, they behave like this, one minus one over K. So if K is equal to D minus one, then it's possible. The probability is greater than zero. And if K is larger, then the probability of success increases with this like a linear decay. And interesting thing is that the optimal parallel protocol is always delayed input state. So this is like generic feature. You can always delay the input state. And well, for sequential, this D minus one thing, it's still zero. But for now, something interesting, like for, if you accept like sequential circuits, the probability of success is greater than or equals this, number here that I said it's not so important, but I think it's nice to see that it's exponential decay. So this shows that sequential like circuit, this adaptive circuit, this protocols of this form, they are like exponentially better than parallel ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now 
Well, I'll try to show you, convince you a bit like why this is the case. Actually, so let's go back to the... Sorry, Marco, can I ask just about something? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, just, uh, can you just comment what happens with this uh, parallel and sequential strategies just for k equal to d? Like, is there a significant, because you analyze it in like, what you said, it's uh, valid in the asymptotic limit, like where k is much larger than d, but like for just mm -hmm. in the onset, like, uh, yeah. what? Yeah, so uh, if, if k is d minus one, the probability is one over d square. For both? For, for, for both, both? Mm. Right. Okay. Ah, yeah, yeah. Ah, so yes, for both, for both. To be honest, to be honest, we don't have a, a proof that it's equal for both, but we have a proof that this is optimal for parallel. But we have, I would say, very good evidence that this is actually optimal. So for qubits and qtreats, for simple case, we could show that this is the optimal for both. But so if you want to be very precise, this is parallel. And for sequential, actually, it's, we don't know. Maybe we can improve. But I'd say it's likely to be one over d square, I think. And, and also, maybe it will become easier to understand later because this is the teleportation scheme. And well, let's see. So this, now I'll try to convince you that the probability of success in sequential strategies, this sequential circuit is exponential. So I'll, I'll try to argue that this is actually something easy. It's not hard. So. Just remember the situation when we had a single use. So in a single use, that was our circuit here, like this chunk here. And when we want something to get it right, usually what do we do? So for example, imagine that you have a coin in your hand and you can flip it and you really want to get heads. Your coin may even be biased. You don't care. Like if you want to get heads and you flip it and then it, you failed, so you got like tails. What do you do? You just flip it again, flip it again, flip it again. If you keep repeating, the probability of getting heads after like K trials is going to approach one very fast, even if your coin is biased. So this is, I'd say. Oh, okay. So it's only Ma uh, Marco who froze, yes? Uh, In yeah. this... uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, you froze for like 10, 15 seconds. <laughs> sorry? Okay. Uh, you froze <laughs> ah, okay. for 10 seconds, yeah. Okay. So you were talking, saying that if we flip many times, then finally we will get heads. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Basically, it's, right, it's quite intuitive. If you have a coin, if you flip many times, the probability of getting heads after k times, so approaches one exponentially, you have this exponential decay. Basically, the probability of failure, failing decays exponentially. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, but as is, if I understand correctly, uh, in your case, this number of times you need to throw a coin uh, is like uh, it is exponential in the number of qubits, right? Because it's a dimension. Uh, is that correct? Uh, or uh, I, I mean, the k should be higher than the dimension. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just one. Yes. Yeah. So in this yeah. sense, it's uh, uh, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> yes. Okay. So now, yes. Yeah, so good question. So now it would make sense because I told you this story about the coin. So, but like, so for example, like check. This is the solution. Well, this is one possible way. As I said, mentioned before, this is equivalent to the qubit inversion with probability one over four. This circuit here, like provides you the, the measurement outcomes here, provide the good things. And probably one of the four, this is exactly, it behaves as the unit, unitary inverse. And then you could try this idea, right? You just repeat, 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 repeat until success. But there's a problem because although I told you the story about the coin, we cannot do it in practice, not directly. Because in the coin example, like when you fail, you still have the coin. 
you can just try it again. But here in this circuit here, when you fail, you destroy your input quantum state. So what do I mean by destroying? Because the unitary here is unknown. So you don't know what is this the unitary U. If you don't know U, you don't know what is U inverse. So basically your output state is this chunk here, like it's this vector here then. Since you don't know this and you don't know the input state, you cannot reiterate the protocol. So this story about flipping coin that I said, it doesn't work. But well, it's actually, there's an easy turn around, right? I don't know you, but if I can use it again, I just apply, or here I put the open, I just apply U2 again, because you choose the inverse of U, so then you cancel here. And I know the outcomes I and, and J, and then I cancel, cancel, I recover my input state. So, voila, you have a technique. So you, for, when single use, you try. If you have success, good. If you fail, you use, you make an extra use just to recover, and then you repeat. So that's why you have this thing. Okay, that's how it works for qubits. Uh, can yeah. I just make a comment, uh, just for people mm -hmm. in general? So something very similar technique is used for when people do magic states in the injection when uh, when they want to like I don't know enrich Clifford circuits with some magic uh, gate. They they use some sort of uh, similar stuff like repeat until success, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just uh, it's something sort of that one can so, sort of this, uh, those techniques are sort of broadly usable. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, just, wow. just come forward. Mm -hmm. So now like a, a small di digression, well, and also to talk about general things. So this uh, technique, it works when you have what we like to call sometimes like success or draw. So imagine that this is like a probabilistic circuit. So it involves a quantum measurement and it has like success output. And, but when you fail, instead of failing, you have what we call draw like that. You apply identity, like you preserve the input state here. If your circuit has this structure that when you, when you have success, you implement the function of you that you want. But when you fail, actually it's not a big failure. You just do nothing, like it's just a draw. Then you get the situation similar to the coin flipping, right? Because when you have success, okay, it's good, you stop success. When you fail, actually, you don't destroy what you have, you just perform identity. If you are in the situation, this would always lead you to this exponential success probability. Or in, in particular, like this success probability will have this structure. Because if you have k uses and your situation is in this form, or you do an input, if, if it's success, good. If it's a draw, do it again, do it again. So then the probability of success will respect this equation in approach to one like fast. And so this is something that we analyzed in, in another like paper that what we call the success of draw strategies. Uh, to be honest, I was also surprised by this result. Like basically we show that success or draw is always possible well, what do I mean here? Like, if you know how to transform u to f of u, so if this happens with some probability p, you have p success. And when you fail, okay, if you fail, you fail. By having, by using the unitary d times, you can construct a success or draw protocol. Actually, the probability hits some epsilon times ps, but I'd say the importance, like it, it's not zero. What? Well, so, uh, this sorry, is... Marco. So, you like this first condition is that you don't know what is happening at all. You don't know, uh, like if if it, hmm? you have a failure, it can be anything. Yes, it can be anything. Okay. So, as I said, if you can do it, then you can do in a success or draw with d uses. So this is this generalizes what happened for the unitary inversion, right? Because we can do it for one use, we can do it, but then it's success or failure. And then with k equals d, in our case, there it's k equals two for the qubit. Then you can do in a success or draw manner. And then you just reiterate, reiterate. So 
for the inversion, this was kind of like obvious, I'd say, because of this structure we had here. So we just need to plug it again. Then we annihilate, we transform this into identity. But it turns out that this idea can be generalized for any function f. So, so basically, this ensures that basically, if you imagine any function of you, if this can be done, this can be done with an exponential success probability like this. Well, actually, so this k here will be k divided by d, right? because you need d. Right? Okay, so now, well, okay, I'll, I'll show them. Like, how do you do like for qubits? Actually, it's again like quite simple to do the unitary transposition for qubits. This is quite simple. It follows from this identity here. Well, th this property that I mentioned before works for any maximally entangled qubit. So basically, it's a nice property of the maximum entangled state that if you have some operation on say Alice side, you can change to Bob side by paying a transposition. So well, if we just basically do teleportation, if you, sometimes people call this gate teleportation protocol leads to that. But if we change where we apply the unitary, it leads to the transpose. And basically this shows that you can transform U to you transpose any dimension d with probability one over d square, single use. And now we can see the trick for qubits that we're done. We broke the unitary inverse. Well, the unitary inverse is the same thing as the adjoint, right? That it's also the same thing as the complex transpose, complex relation transpose. And our idea was to break the protocol into two. We do the conjugation and we do the transposition. So the transposition here works for any dimension D. And now what about this one? Actually, it doesn't hold for any dimension D in this simple way, but there is a trick that was also researched by this Buddhist monk, Miyazaki-san. Then, well, I don't think it's so important details, but maybe you have seen this operator here before, this guy here, like it's a isometry that transforms the linear space the CD into the anti-symmetric space of CD with D minus one uses. So basically, so for example, if you have like a, a Q-treat, this is going to transform like a Q-treat state into a two Q-treat state that lies in this totally anti-symmetric space. And well, if you do the calculation, you see that this is true. You can prove, you can have some intuition, but for now, just trust me on this one. That it means that you can do complex conjugation if, if K is equal to D plus one, you can always do this exactly. Well, here, if you want D minus one. Then, well, we're good. Now with k equal d minus one, with parallel circuits, we can always succeed in unitary inversion of p over d square. We just combine the transposition scheme to the complex conjugation scheme. And showing that with d minus one is not possible. Actually, so this was not so simple. It was an open question in this previous paper. But well, by playing around a little bit, we can show that Complex conjugation is not possible. And if complex conjugation is not possible with any probability, for it's zero, then inverse is not possible. And well, I think now it's already too long. I don't want to put more details, but if you want to improve teleportation, uh, improve, improve unitary transposition with more uses, like many uses to some U to U transpose, one nice trick to do is this part based teleportation. And we can actually sh show that. So if you know part-based teleportation, maybe you get it. If not, we can discuss later on. But so Michael, in principle, you have like 15 minutes for around. So you have some time. Okay. Okay. 
But, but anyhow, I'll just let for now that part based teleportation provides a constructive way because in part based teleportation, well, there are some technicalities, but I'll say that the core for us, the important thing is for part based teleportation, you have this optimal state. This, and this state here, this part based teleportation state, respects this property here. You transpose. Okay. So, Actually, this part-based teleportation state is not the maximally entangled state. So it's, it's different than the maximally entangled, so not. But it has this property here that we like. And somehow, roughly speaking, that's why it works. And so this provides a constructive, a constructive way to implement unitary transposition. And we could show then this is actually tight. This is actually the best you can do for parallel. Okay. And for, for just, just, just mm -hmm. one, one question. So here you you are using this uh, so-called probabilistic port-based teleportation. Yes, 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 yes. So yes. that you know, like, if the protocol works, you know that the state actually teleported. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. okay. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, now, well, something interesting that we can ask like can we go beyond of quantum circuits because i told you this nice story then actually the most general thing you can do is a quantum circuit blah blah but that story i was telling before actually only holds for the case of single use if you if you consider like let's say the most general transformation a pair of unitary operations actually you can do a few things that they are a bit crazy for example this quantum switch I think I don't know if I've seen this quantum switch before, but at least that the intuition is you can imagine this interferometer here that when you have some control state that is zero, your system like goes from one path, you implement some this G or imagine a unitary operation represented by G and then F. And if you have a control state in one, you follow a different path. So by playing with this interferometer, we can imagine a situation where we add this control state in a coherent superposition. So where you don't follow exactly one, I'll say definite order. Well, this discussion can take some, some time again, like we can go back, but basically what I want to argue is that in principle, quantum mechanics allow transformations that they go beyond the quantum circuit formalism. And then there's a long discussion to say, like, is it a single use or double use? There are many discussions, but my point is that mathematically speaking, we can define these objects as like the most like the most general physical transformation that transforms a pair of channels into a channel. And then like you, you just ask for consistency with quantum mechanics, and you don't say anything about causal order or quantum circuits. And if you push this thing further you find what people like to call sometimes this process matrices, or well, it also has some other names, but my point is that these process matrices, they may have this indefinite causal order, and in principle, they are not forbidden by quantum mechanics. So, well, there are some funny things like counting the number of uses, what do you mean, like you cannot draw, but in principle, they are not forbidden, and you can ask like, how powerful they are for this particular task. And if you remember what I mentioned before, basically our proofs, they were like kind of like constructive. We constructed a circuit by using intuition on teleportation port base. And then we tried to show is it optimal or not, success or draw. But now in this indefinite causal order, we don't have a good intuition, at least not for now. And ah, okay, but one comment is that this indefinite causal order thing, this theorem still holds. So you still need at least k, uh, oops, you need at least k equal d minus one. If the number of uses is smaller than d minus one, so the probability of success is still zero, even with this powerful resource, this indefinite causality. And for the cases where k is greater than or equal d minus one, so we couldn't come up with any protocol because of well, we lack of intuition, but we could formalize our problem in terms of semi-definite programming. Well, to be honest, I don't expect you 
to understand what is written here, but it's, I just wanted to put some equations like, well, we can talk about SDP, but basically this is a class of convex optimization problems that we can use the computer to solve it efficiently. So using some numerical methods, we can find like tables like this, where this is the optimal success probability for doing unitary inversion. So for qubits, the optimal in parallel is one over four. Uh, values in blue are the ones we could prove. It's a mathematical proof analytically. And values like in black, they come from the computer. So strictly speaking, they are not uh, a proof. But we can see here that indefinite causal order strategies, they do provide an advantage over sequential. So when k is greater than d minus one, apparently indefinite causal order they, it is useful. Michael, can I comment about the last row? Mm -hmm. It's a bit weird. So we have a Q treat and two user, uh, usages of uh, uh, of channel, and all those strategies give the same success probability. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's actually what I mentioned before. What I would conjecture, what I believe is that if this holds the number of uses d minus one. I think the probability of success is one over d squared. I think this is true for every k, well, every k respecting this constraint. And actually, so here, this is a, if you want like computational like evidence that this is true for qubits and qtrits. Well, for qubits, it's obviously true because for qubits, well, k, equal d minus one becomes one and then single use, everything is the same. So it doesn't make sense. But for q truths and q quants, there's a PhD student from Julio, this Moin, that could prove that this is true. So this is true for d equals three and d equals four. And also for d equals two, but d equals two is, let's say, that the optimal can be done in parallel and given by this combination of a uh, complex uh, aggregation transposition. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, in principle, it's not obvious. I don't. So his proof is a bit brute force. That's why he couldn't generalize. So it's a very brute force proof. Okay. And well, something I didn't mention, like deterministic non-exact protocols. So before we were asking like to be exact. But we accept like this probability of failure. We do like success and probability of failure. But now I'll discuss only a little bit about this deterministic non-exact protocols. And here, one way to quantify the performance would be this average chain of fidelity. Actually, in the previous version of my slide, I had the definition here. But well, I don't think to be honest, I don't think the definition is important. It's just a way the definition. Okay, it's not important, but it's a way to evaluate performance that is very fair and also coincides for a large class of problems, coincides with the maximum white noise visibility, which uh, do I want to write? Well, no. So this like it's a way to quantify the performance of our, our, our protocols. And this question was tackled before by all well, these people here, like Dariano, Alessandro Bizio, Mihal Sedline. And they analyze this situation here. They analyze the case where the function you want to implement is a representation of a group. Basically, the only the requirement they need is, is a homeomorphism thing. Oh, well, my V is not so nice. <laughs> I just repeat the equation there. So in this situation here, they have proven that everything can be parallelized. So under this figure of merit, Actually, even more, so this figure of merit is very general. You can, it's also this worst case fidelity is the same. So basically, if your function f respect this property, this, then everything can be parallelized. Kind of surprising and nice result, I'd say. And this covers complex conjugation, right? Because if you imagine that this f of u here is the complex conjugation, 
then you have this property, right? Because the complex conjugation of the product is the product of the complex conjugation. And it also works for case that I didn't discuss up to here, but people like a lot like cloning, that it's basically you want to transform a single use of a unitary operator to many uses, similar to like cloning a quantum state. You cannot do it perfectly, but you can imagine like optimal cloning. But what happens if instead of respecting this homeomorphism, you do this, right? You change the order. And actually, even a, a question for, for you that I have later, like, do we have a name for these functions, this class of functions here? Yeah. I don't know. This one, I think they call people call homeomorphism, right? This one, I don't know. But, so probably if you take different, like, composition, like when you, like, with the, like, you know, <laughs> anti-homomorphism or something like that. Yeah. I, I found like some paper that they call this a uh, right representation, this left representation. But okay. yeah. but the thing is that well, these people here they analyze situations where your function is similar to the complex conjugation. They are a representation. And now we decided to check like if we flip the order, or our motivation is because the unitary inverse. You flip the order, right? Because if you have u v inverse, well, just remember that the inverse is the adjoint, right? This, is this dagger thing. And then because of the transposition, you, you flip the order of your product. So this motivates us to analyze this case here. And actually in this scenario, so we could prove the optimal parallel qubit inversion. So that's the best way to transform this k copies of qubit into a qubit inverse. Where here, like I'm doing an approximation with this average fidelity. And actually for this particular case, we could evaluate, like find a simple formula. And our method basically is to identify that this problem is essentially the same as the unitary estimation. It's highly connected to a unitary estimation problem. And well, similar to the, the other case, in parallel, we have this linear decay, right? One minus something over k. And here is exponential. So we also have this exponential separation for a different figure of memory. Uh, sorry, here you also need k to be large in order for this to hold or not? Uh, no, no, so... This is true for every k. Yeah, is it? yeah this, this here it's true for, for every k. So it's qubits, right? So, but this holds for every. Ah, okay. It's for qubits. Sorry, I forgot. Yes, 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 yes. For okay, awesome. No, for qubits, we couldn't have a beautiful formula like this. We just mm -hmm. have yeah. bounds. And here I just put this asymptotic expansion of the cosine just to make it easier to compare. But yeah, so this also holds for every k. So, so. But B is fixed as qubits. Well, this phenomenon happens for any qubit, this exponential separation, but I put qubits because we can have some beautiful numbers. And well, here there are some interesting things then, because like for the deterministic case, actually it's not a simple analysis. It, it's not the same thing as the probabilistic exact. So first, that probability basically potential is not optimal anymore. So this is funny because as Mihal already mentioned, so there are two different versions of this part based teleportation. The deterministic one, where you always have an output and you use this fidelity to quantify your performance. And the probabilistic one, where you may fail, but when you get it right, it's perfect. And funny enough, like for, for our probabilistic case, our problem kind of coincides with part based, part -based teleportation. But in the deterministic, the problems are different. So, well, okay, in, in this part here, like this deterministic thing, if everything goes right, we'll be on archive next month, hopefully. <laughs> so maybe I was even longer than I wanted. So let's finish. So the main message is then, yeah, but unitary version is possible. And for parallel, it behaves something like this. For sequential, it behaves as, like this. Of course, it also depends on D. There's some factors that I mentioned here, but I think that's the main message I'd like you to keep. And also we have this D minus one thing, like not always. So 
we require the number of uses to be at least d minus one. If not, like you cannot do it exact. Well, another thing that I hope that I have convinced you that this super channel, this high order, this is interesting. And well, I think during this path, this study, like we came up with some new methods, like some concepts, like this delayed input state or other things, and this SDP approach that actually, well, perhaps surprising, it's not so obvious that you can phrase the problems as an SDP. And while we discussed a bit this indefinite causal order, that wasn't like the main, but. And something like, I'll say a kind of question is applications for our findings. So I don't know, actually for, for me, this is an application itself. So it's an application for the methods that this Avia people, this higher order, we are applying this for implementing functions of you, I don't know. But apparently majority of the field disagree with me. So, and they look for applications. <laughs> so it would be nice to have some application. And why well, I don't know, I put this delayed input state here because I found it interesting because it was a surprise, something we didn't ask for, it came for free. So, voila, that's it. Yeah. Thanks, Marco, for the great talk. I got uh, yeah, I got it as a mass. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, we have time for questions, comments to, to the speaker. <laughs> Don't be shy. Well, I mean, I have a like kind of comment or question. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, because if you go back to the final slide, uh, which is without thank you, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, about like those applications or whatever, right? So in practice, as far uh, there, uh, I know that this like looks great that there is the, like, I mean, it's interesting <laughs> fundamentally that there is this separation, uh, exponential separation, but in practice, I mean, you know, for a uh, small system, it, uh, systems there is already or was no difference right because uh well i mean if k is equal to thousand for 10 qubits or something then uh then i guess this probability for both strategies is uh great right uh so uh and but on the other hand i guess that it might uh, it is kind of okay so it depends on the details but probably sequential stuff uh requires much less resources right yes uh, in practice uh, so this yes. is like so this is cool that uh, uh, I I mean I would be uh, so okay uh, in uh, I would probably be happy even if there was no separation but that you can do with the smaller circuits but in the adaptive scenario it would also be nice <laughs> yes uh, so so yeah uh, I, yeah that's just uh, yeah, and yes, good, good observation because, of, of, of course, when you count resources, so for example, several papers, people say that parallel, you have, it's somehow better because in parallel, you, you only need like one encoder, one decoder, like, so it's kind of cheaper. And it's also very fast because you can do it, depth of your circuit is small. But as you pointed out, maybe in practice, to be honest, I think the parallel implementation is way harder. Because if you want to do parallel implementation, you need to have this, at least the optimal one, you need to have this port-based teleportation state that is not obvious. So you need to do things that are non-trivial. But a sequential protocol is very simple because you just need this. So basically it's just teleportation. Or you, if you want to go to the lab and do that, actually I, I didn't mention, but some people in China made an experimental paper on this. Oh, nice. Yeah, I should have mentioned it. Like, I was very what surprised. Sorry? Uh, platform for nothing. <laughs> no, he, he meant like what was the architecture <laughs> they used, like what but, are the but, qubits. But I hope they didn't have uh, a causal, like indeterministic causal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So, Ma Marco, but you froze when answering, so we still don't know what they did exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, th no, they have done the simplest thing. Basically, they have done what is here in this green box. 
So, well, they just got like an optical implementation. They perform the sigma y. I think they do this with a crystal. And they do here a sigma y. And here they plug any qubit unitary operation that is encoded uh, in some optical element. Mm -hmm. And here, well, I think in optics, people are good in doing these bell measurements. Oh, they have some technicalities, but up to some approximation of this bell measurement. And then they can just reiterate the protocol. So this is the qubit version is very simple. If you want to go to the lab and implement this, it's. But uh, did they do adaptive things? Right. Uh, so to be honest, the adaptive. Is... So no, they didn't do like the nice adaptive way where they chain one to another because. So uh, actually, for me, this paper was a bit of a surprise because none of the authors contacted us. So one day I checked in the archive that they implemented. I was very happy. I was also very surprised. Yeah. And I never discussed with anyone, but I discussed with the experimentalists here from Vienna because I wanted them to explain the experimental yeah. paper for me <laughs> because yeah. it was this funny situation that I couldn't understand the experimentalists, yeah. although I was involved in the theory. <laughs> in, and they don't consider that they implemented the adaptive case because for it becomes a matter of somehow interpretation because for the adaptive, what would be nice is to do like a chain, right? In a fast way. But yes. since they do it with like photons, like they don't have time to find out the outcome and to set the power operation. Sure. So they yeah. kind of do it one by one, enforce an adaptive interpretation. But it's not like an adaptive sense that they do like a chain directly. So yes. they do one, they pause, they see, and then they do other, they pause, they see. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes. They, they... So can I just make a comment like about this discussion, parallel versus sequential? Yes. So you know when we like when we get taught quantum mechanics or like quantum information, like this adaptive like uh, adaptive measurements or adaptive schemes, they come for free. But actually, in practical implementations, like for example, for the reasons that Michael just mentioned, they are not uh, like you don't uh, you don't have it because uh, like your photons cannot wait for you to make mm. uh, like new op uh, operation. And uh, also, I, I think just recently, like uh, you know, people are playing with those uh, prototypes of quantum computers, like by IBM and and others. Mm -hmm. But only just recently, uh, IBM implemented uh, some variant of uh, of adaptive ski. Uh, uh, well, possibility to do adaptive communication, yes. mm -hmm. and they were bragging about it. You know, and it's <laughs> highly like a non-trivial thing to to do. And also, just sorry, I will be very general, but many protocols in quantum information, like when you do error correction. For example, you really need to do stuff adaptively. You need to check your system, uh, yeah. do something to to uh, to it. So, like, it, it makes a bit like harder to even to, to compare yeah. for actual implementations those resources because, uh, yeah. Uh, sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's definitely true. Of course. Like I. Uh, so I was uh, uh, thinking. Uh, so what is not. Uh, like uh yeah what is sure is that the sequential circuits are simpler right like in the you know the, this is just uh obvious that they are simpler but then the question is how well you can control like after measurement your stuff and uh, everything right so so uh, actually I, I don't fully agree with what you said that you said that this is obviously simpler things of this form uh, well, yeah, I mean, not really, be, uh, you don't think, because this is like what, you have some fixed size system, right? And there you need a copies and some uh, yeah. but, like complicated but, operations, perhaps, like on this encoders and decoders. True, true, uh, true. But, but one, one observation, actually, so it's not easy to notice maybe, but this is more general than any adaptive scheme. Uh, what, uh, which one? Because I don't see your mouse now. Uh, uh, okay, so this, no, no, this, this, this one here mm -hmm. that I put in pink now. This is yes. more general than any adaptive scheme. This is adaptive. This sequential. So mm -hmm. you, you see, right? Because at here, when you perform this measurement, you can always write your measurement as a channel 
that sends, if you want, a flag over the auxiliary space, mm -hmm. and you only do a measurement in the very end. So you can always point your measurement at the very end. So this circuit here, although it's a fixed thing, it may be very hard. So mm, okay, so but adaptive. so this uh, this means that you perform. Uh, so you are saying that you can move the measurement at the end of the series. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, I see, I see. Yes, yeah, yes. So, uh -huh. so actually, so then, so okay, so this is what I was thinking that it is more like, you know, uh, small circuit measurement, small circuit measurement, and like this. Yes. Right? So then, in this sense, it, it, there are simple circuits, but in this case, uh, okay, so now I understand. So yeah, yeah, I just point like it's not obvious in the first C, but this drawing here this kind of sequential circuit like is more general than the adaptive that I you understand. it's, it's okay. actually more general and and okay. and for example we could for our problem actually we could well here I just wrote in terms of stp but we could have an explicit uh, circuit showing that our scheme is suboptimal we can see that from the stp it's suboptimal because we do this part, we do it and then adapt the plan. But if you do everything in a shop, it's better. So, so nice. for, for example, here, like the optimal sequential has this probability three over four. But if we follow our technique, oh, then it's one over four plus. Oh, I don't remember, but it's more. <laughs> <laughs> you may fail, so. It's one minus three quarter square, you know? <laughs> Is it correct? Yeah. One minus one quarter. Yes, one minus three quarter square. <laughs> one minus nine over 60. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> oh, no. Nice. Kevin. <laughs> Is it correct? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I think our protocol leads to something this that it's smaller than if you divide by four, so it's seven over four divided by four. And seven over four is smaller than three. So well. So minor. Okay. 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 Any more questions to yes, I think. Uh, to, oh, Zolta, uh, yes actually <laughs> and I have a very general question, Marco. Yes, thank about you. the crazy part of your talk. <laughs> uh, or not crazy part. Uh, so basically my question is that obviously this indefinite causal order is okay, you can understand it and so on, but do you think there is any uh, physical situation where this will become relevant, let's say, I don't know, in, in black, near black horse or something, or where, where, how can you imagine that this will become relevant? Yeah. Or relevant or even experiment? Okay, I mean, I'm not even asking about the experimental feasibility. Yeah. Hmm. Well, actually, so this is a intense, there's an intense debate, right? So, well, last year, like when I was, I was in a conference in Hong Kong, the people, many people, well, Charles Lev was there, like Julia Kiribella, many Pavia people were there, like, and we were, we were discussing like this super channel here, and people would have very different opinions, but I can tell you mine. So I think, yes, in my so opinion, your... like, I don't care so much if this is really indefinite causal order, like, because there are many discussions for the, when you do this, does it count as a single use of each or not? Like, I don't care for this thing. What, what for me, it would be nice is, if people get, and there are experiments reporting the quantum switch. So if you, there are, I don't know, five or four papers that they claim that they have done things that cannot be explained by a definite causal order. And there's this debate, I never if, understand. Yeah, and there's this debate if it's fair or not. Then I think, so then for me, what I'd like is something that you cannot do with quantum circuits, with the sequential thing. While I cannot, let's say, for example, the probability of success is basically zero or or the length of your circuit grows exponentially like it's it, it will take i don't know 10 to the power 10,000 years i don't know but 
with the indefinite causal order, you solve it like in one minute. Something a bit similar to what people like to call this uh, quantum supremacy in this direction, because this, I think this settles the question. That's, I think that's the only way that, I don't know, that we can escape, because then it's very practical. Like, I have a task that I can describe you the task and using this crazy switch extra resources, you solve this task. So in the end, I don't care if it's really indefinite causal order, if you're using black holes, I don't care. I just know that with this mentality, you can solve a practical problem. And I think this will settle, like this will be a big progress. So there is research, or I'm also working on that and some other people like trying to come up because there are some papers showing that this indefinite causal order can reduce complexity, complexity class of algorithm. But the, the improvement is uh, sublinear, it's very bad. So it's log improvement. And then what would be nice- I remember Mattel's had some work. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and just, uh, mm -hmm. Didn't he claim exponential perhaps for something, but it was maybe a bit contrived. No, 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 no. It's it, actually they, they, what they claim is a uh, quadratic. I see. So what he conjectured that it's exponential if you compare with classical computation. Ah, but if you compare okay. with the quantum, with the standard quantum computation and quantum computation with the switch, then it's quite quadratic. Mm -hmm. Actually, so in Matteo's paper, they suggested that it's quadratic. Well, in computer science, it's impossible to prove things, right? Basically, you have no, no one can prove anything. So then, yeah, but with certain <laughs> assertions, certain yes, yeah. Yeah, yes. But for example, this paper of Matteo's, they showed it's quadratic. But in this recent paper by Martin, I know it was an archive like, well, this month or last month, they show it's actually sublinear. It, it, uh, not, not even quadratic, it's log, the complexity. Oh, okay. so it, 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 it's, it's worse than square. Right? So with the quantum switch, the complex is n, and without the quantum switch, the complex is n log n. So the, the, the improvement is minor. So then I think something in this direction would settle the question. Like if you came up with a problem similar to this one with Matthews, where the gap is so big that this indefinite causal order objects, they provide you an actual advantage in a task where you can really go to the lab and check, then I think the, the philosophy debate is somehow <laughs> over. You, 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 of course, the philosophical debate will always be there. You can always argue, is it definite causal order or not? But at least you say, okay, this is a powerful resource and I can go to the lab. And if you don't do this switch implementation, like I don't care if it's causal order, but in practice, it shows me an advantage over the quantum circuit formalism. So I'm more, I'm very pragmatic. I don't know, I find it interesting, but I don't go so deep in this philosophical debate. I would like to see a concrete application. But you are pragmatic, but also optimistic then. Yeah, yes, yes. betting on the fact that this can be still done. No, to, but to, to be honest, what, what I think is, so the, I think there will be such a thing, but not with the quantum switch. Ah, okay. So so then it will be in, it will be in a situation. I don't know if you are familiar, there's this process people sometimes call this WOCB for Oreshkov, Chaslav, Bruckner, or it's one. One of I, I know this paper of this is this famous paper, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. But yeah. well, these are just pick one example, but there are many examples that you have processes that they don't have a definite causal order, but they are not of the switch type. They are very different than switch. And actually, in our work, sure, this, sure. This, for this particular problem we address, the switch is useless because switch and also generalization of switch they are useless because for us. Well, we have like two copies of you that they are identical, right? So switch, they don't they don't help because it doesn't matter. F and G are the same. So for our particular problem, the switch is useless. And then now I think we are going to find such a task where indefinite causal order, order objects, they perform better. So you're going to find like in the paper. But now next question is, can you implement that in the lab? So people claim that the switch is implementable. Of course, there's a debate, but you can do something similar to the switch in the lab. But we don't know how to do this OCD or general things in the lab. So it may be the case that we are in this funny situation that indefinite causal order is useful in the paper, but we don't know how to do the experiment. 
That's what I believe. So it's semi-optimistic. So, uh, I ask, so uh, but in some sense, one can okay. Like now, by the way, it's like sort of like semi-formal sort of part of the, uh, of the talk, right? We're mm -hmm. just sort of chatting. But like, uh, like if you can adjust about advantage, of course there will be some advantage for some task uh, because you can. Like uh, I guess that uh, this this whole thing fits in this convex set business that people study, right? And you have uh, quantum combs, like or convex combinations of quantum combs, right? Mm -hmm. Or this kind of strategies that you can uh, for given number of inputs, say. And you have, on the other hand, uh, the the bigger object, like the bigger class of objects, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like those those. Super channels that can possibly have indefinite cause or other, and like there are those general results in resource theory uh, fears that you can c connect some games, right? Mm -hmm. To to just being outside, like uh, you know, that would be witnesses, right? So you yes. can always. Uh, I mean, maybe then the task is to find the interpretation of such a game, uh, or uh, yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So, 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 is that uh, some of the the direction that you guys are trying, or uh, like uh, you want to get asymptotic improvement, like in terms of like the size of the system? Well, what I would really like is to get some asymptotic improvement. That it could at least be implementable, but the less. So, something that I I'm doing like recently is just to try to analyze basically every task, everything that is possible. So I started on these things, not because of the indefinite causal order, but more because of transformations with circuits. But then I realized that the math is essentially the same. So every problem I work, I try to do indefinite causal order, like this one. Like for us, it was like a cherry. It was not our main research, but since the math is very similar, and, and also especially if you use the computer for semi-definite programming, it doesn't make a difference, right? If the computer is doing the calculation, we just plug it in. So now basically every problem I work, every task I imagine, I try to do this indefinite causal order, just to see, because some tasks, they are useless. And some tasks they are useful. And you can also divide like in groups, for example, as I mentioned, in this problem I presented now, transforming K users of some unitary, this class of switch, this the generalized switch-like classes is useless. So this is also something interesting, I would say, like that the class where people like, the class that people claim to be like implementable doesn't help anything. So I think it's it's an important part of research. Like try to rule out tasks that they're useful, tasks that they are not. Like, and ideally, I would say the final goal is to identify one task where we have like a big gap. You, usually I, I, this probably would be like asymptotically, right? So, and then you make the gap like, very very big one so right, depending yeah. on the resources like if it's probability if yeah. it's time i don't know find some way to quantify it and try to go for this supremacy so <laughs> right okay can i ask you one last thing uh like there is one process that uh, maybe from computational point of view i maybe care about okay uh, like uh, fast forwarding of unitary or like yeah. sort of implementing multiple uh, sort of operations in, in a sequence uh, of a unitary. So can you transform talk? this to, I don't know, let's say N? Yeah. What is like, uh, yeah. in general, what can you guys do with that? Actually, it's very funny. We, we are researching on this now, me and Daniel. And there is one paper on this, but this paper only has one citation. I don't know why. I think it deserves more. So it's an interesting paper. Some people from Iran, they are not from the community somehow. And well, this paper, like, so th this problem first come, this problem is hard. So it's substantially harder than the ones I presented because you don't have, first, it's not linear. Why are the other ones? Although it doesn't feel it's linear in the chart representation, right? This one is not linear, so this problem is harder. And you cannot tackle with these representation things. So it's not like cloning where you you respect this property, right? U V equals to F of U times F of. Um, there is so, one. There is one paper by Dorit Aharonov on that. Fast forward. 
Miss, well, Miss, for its nature, uh, uh, like from 17, 16, something like that. I'm just sort of saying. Uh, okay, so I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Because it's, you know, it's somehow sometimes relevant for, for quantum computing. Like people, like if you can do, like, I assume like in the lab, you can do like this many steps of time evolution and you actually want to uh, like for, fast forward. Right? Yeah. Some uh, Hamiltonians, you can fast forward, some you can't. There's a paper by uh, Miguel Navasquez as well on this recent one by Miguel Navasquez. And M Miguel's scenario is a bit different than ours, so he works in a more restricted version. He cannot do anything, like, because he, well, what is that? You have a system and you put another one closer and you only act on your auxiliary space. It's a bit different. But he focused precisely on this question, this transformation here. And what we, we are doing now, so, well, we have some comments basically like transforming k uses well we have basically some numbers on optimal average fidelity but we couldn't find any nice results and numbers we got well with the computer but even with the computer this problem is high because this is not an sdp anymore so we we, we bound the thing we're using sdp so this problem is considerably harder than the ones i present uh, right now, we focus a little bit on this, but it's like a stamp collection. We just have some numerics for different values of n. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I know there is one student from Julio, this guy, this Moim. At some point, he was studying, uh, he got some fairly interesting things. So he was analyzing the case where, well, he was doing qubits and two copies, and he wanted to transform this to you square use you twice but with a parallel circuit and then uh, so he, because if you do sequentially or it's trivial just do nothing like that sequentially yeah, yeah. in parallel and he wondered like if the best thing was to do teleportation and it turns out that it's not there are some funny things mm -hmm. but yeah i don't know the status of this project i didn't meet him again i don't know if he's publishing or working on yeah but this question is nice huh? uh, I would like to work, uh, well, we are working a bit more, but up to now, like it's so hard, just collection of numerics, basically. Hmm. Sure. Okay, uh, last chance to ask something to Marco. He really like gave a, gave a perfect pitch about indefinite causal orders and higher <laughs> order quantum mechanics. Let's move. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. okay, I have like a quick question because I okay. like about this uh, super channels, uh, like in general. So uh, does the like hierarchy of operations end at super channels, so no. to speak? So what's uh, how how does it work? Like, uh, what are people interested in? Do they try to just you know define super channels and super channels uh, yeah. infinitum? Yeah. Uh, actually, this is also fun because this is this is something that I'm I'm also working now with with Seba and the guy that was group. But that, there are some things. So I think there are two main papers on this. One is Paolo Perinotti, single author. Another one is Esteban Castro and Chaslav Brookman here. And what you pointed like, well, how the story come up, came up, right? If, if you say you have a quantum state row, you say, well, I want to understand dynamics of quantum states in terms of this input output. So I want to transform like row input, some row output. And this, well, so if you like states, you also like, you like to put a tilde, you also like channels. So then you want to transform channels into channels. Well, and then if you like channels, you also like dynamics on channels. So you also like super channels, right? And then you, as you pointed out, now I want to transform super channels. So I want to do this. So then I want like a, if this is a super channel, so I want now a super, super channel and you, you can go, it doesn't stop, right? And I'll say they're equally well motivated, right? So if you like the motivation for super channels, you are somehow forced to like the super, super channel. But it turns out that for super, super channels, you don't have this uh, nine mic dilation thing so that you can realize in terms of circuits. So these super, super channels are weird objects. So if you want, they also have like indefinite causal order like somehow. Mm -hmm. 
So it's yeah. like proven that there is no such thing. Yes, like there is some counterexample of whatever, or it's just yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. It, it, it's it's quite it's simple to prove somehow if you put everything in the good notation. Like it's not so hard. So, uh, and I think but, there are currently only two papers, but but do you mean that those guys cannot be implemented by uh, that by a circuit uh, or by a channel <laughs> then? Like, you know, you could have analog of Neymar spot for uh, that you can interpret it as a channel on the bigger space and not a circuit. <laughs> I would say that they cannot be implemented by a channel. So you, you, cannot, mm -hmm. you cannot write this transformation, the quantum circuit formalism, because so just- Ah, okay, it's okay. Mm -hmm. If you consider this, That's object here this object here like as your super channel what would it be like a super super channel in the quantum circuit so it would be something maybe like this i'm very bad in drawing let's see if i mean i don't know ah. but well you can try to imagine things that you can do in terms of this encoder decoder yes but it's not so hard to find an example of something that it's acceptable in the sense that it, it maps super channels to super channels so it's acceptable mm -hmm. but it doesn't admit a decomposition in terms of encoders decoders like in other things okay so that's the reason mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, some, something nice in this direction that part of people like a lot and i also find interesting is this comps if you consider so if you want to transform a comb into a channel, then it's simple because if you have a k slot comb, so a k slot order circuit, and you want to transform this into a channel, this is always okay in the sense that you can always do this by a quantum circuit. And how you do it is with a k minus one comb. Because well, I don't know if you can see kind of geometrically, if you have like this comb, oh, again, drawing. Oh, you can, <laughs> oh, better. And then this, what comes out is a channel. Oh. So if you want to transform like K slot comb into a channel, this can always be done by a K minus one slot comb. But if you want to go up in this hierarchy, super, 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 things, they get very crazy and they go outside somehow of the acceptable things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay cool cool <laughs> thanks so even on that uh yeah it would be funny if something like that is even realizable like yeah of those operations but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah you can even show it's a small subclass of things that you can realize so you can do by just like dimension counting, you can show that this, the realizable ones by realizable, like in this circuit thing, like mm -hmm. they have measure zero because they are smaller in terms of dimension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I guess with that, we'll conclude for now. Thanks, Mariko, for your time. <laughs>